Hello and welcome to another installment of Theatre House Profiles in which we document Broadway theaters, their histories, and whatever other facts we can find about them. Today, we're going to be talking about very sentimental, personal, and close to my heart. And at the same time, try not to get too emotional over it. A little over a month ago, I attended closing night of the Spongebob Squarepants musical. I had to, knowing that that would be the last time I'd ever set foot in my most favorite house on Broadway ever, before it went through four years of refurbishment. The beautiful, historical Palace Theater. For 105 years, this theater has delighted audiences with all sorts of wonderful shows and performances, from its early days as the most iconic vaudeville house on Broadway, to its days as a movie house, to when it was bought by the Nederlanders and became a Broadway theater, to its final days when it was home to an optimistic yellow sponge from my childhood. Not only was this theater a filming place for one of my childhood favorites, it was also once home to the very show that changed my life for the better. This house sure has had a history, but as I said before, it wasn't always an official Broadway musical theater. Our story begins in the early 1910s, when San Francisco-based vaudeville entrepreneur Martin Beck, head of the Orpheum Circuit, decided he'd go big on the East Coast after having success in the West Coast. He funded a new vaudeville house to be built in New York City by Kirchhoff and Rose, and located at 1564 Broadway with 1,743 seats, a number it still held until its final days. Unfortunately, in doing this, he had a challenge to deal with. B.F. Keith and E.F. Albee's already successful East Coast vaudeville monopoly. To avoid competition from this new rival, Albee made a rule for his circuit that any act that played the new theater would be banned from the Keith Albee circuit. However, Beck still needed performers, so he struck up a deal with Albee to use acts from his circuit. Albie demanded that Beck give up 75% ownership of the house so he could use acts from the circuit in the palace. They agreed, but Beck was still in control of booking. When the theater finally opened with headliner Ed Wynn, it wasn't an instant success. The opening show received negative reviews. Things didn't look good for the palace. It was losing money quickly and on the express line for failure. That all soon changed on May 5, 1913 when 70-year-old France-based Sarah Bernhardt and her partner, Lou Telligan, bought their repertoire to the palace for their first show in vaudeville in New York. The show became a popular sensation, and with that, Sarah and Lou had saved the palace. The success only grew from there, and the palace soon became the premier venue of the Keith Albee circuit. Soon, it became the place where everyone wanted to perform, and naturally, Albee decided to take advantage of its success. At times, he would trade on the performer's desire to play the palace, so to speak, by forcing the acts to take pay cuts for the privilege. But nobody gave a hoot about this. Anyone who played the palace meant that they had reached the highest point of their career. Broadway vaudeville and film star Jack Haley wrote, Only a vaudevillian who has trod its stage can really tell you about it. Only a performer can describe the anxieties, the joys, the anticipation, and the exultation of a week's engagement at the palace. The walk through the Iron Gate on 47th Street, through the courtyard to the stage door, was the cum laude walk to a show business diploma. A feeling of ecstasy came with the knowledge that this was the palace, the epitome of the more than 15,000 vaudeville theaters in America, and the realization that you have been selected to play it. Of all the thousands upon thousands of vaudeville performers in the business, you are there. This was a dream fulfilled. This was the pinnacle of variety success. Whether you were a featured act or another act, just getting the opportunity to play at the Palace Theater meant that your career would be set for life. But it was a real honor to play the coveted headline spot, which was the act right before the closing act. A typical Palace bill usually had nine acts, Famous palace headliners include, but are far from limited to, Ethel Barrymore, Lillian Russell, Marie Dressler, Weber and Fields, and the ever-popular Marx Brothers. Other performers include Bob Hope, Al Jolson, Eddie Cantor, 
Gus Edwards, Fred Astaire, Benny Fields, Ethel Merman, and Bing Crosby. Across the street from the palace, in between acts, performers would gather on a concrete island known as the Palace Beach. Today, the area is known as Duffy Square, and is home to the statues of George M. Cohan and Father Francis Duffy and the Tickets Booth. Yep, life was nothing but sunshine for the palace, but then the Great Depression hit, and we all know where things go from there. In 1927, two years before the crash, the jazz singer opened a few blocks uptown, and that would change not just the palace, but entertainment in the city forever. Film and radio started to rise in popularity, while vaudeville started to take a hit. Live performers started to give up the stage for the microphone, and live performances really took a hit when a new form of entertainment known as the talking motion picture started to become famous. Even after the stock market crash, the palace did have some successful acts, but there weren't as many as there used to be, and they had to resort to gimmicks to gain an audience. One of those gimmicks being to use celebrities who weren't true vaudevillians, like they did with Sarah Bernhardt years prior. Eventually, they had to turn to washed-up silent screen stars, then a merger with RCA and the film booking office at the hands of Joseph P. Kennedy led to the transformation of all Keith Albee Orpheum's vaudeville houses into movie houses. This was a major blow, but it did allow many audiences to see their favorite radio performers of the day on the palace stage. To keep funds for the palace up, the palace increased shows per day from two to three in 1929, and by 1932, it rose once again to four, while also lowering its admission price, and soon, they added a fifth. July 9th, 1932, was the last week of straight vaudeville at the palace. From then on, the palace was never as successful a vaudeville house as it once was, and it weaved in and out of film and live appearances. Films were added to its shows in a desperate attempt, and on November 12th, the last two-a-day vaudeville show accompanied by a film was presented at the palace, with Nick Lucas and Hal Leroy appearing on the closing bill. Five days later, it was renamed to the RKO Palace, and, like a lot of other Broadway theaters, the palace was converted into a cinema. Unfortunately, the palace struggled with success as a cinema house. Back then, most of the bigger movies went to the flagship cinemas of major studios like Warner Brothers, and the palace had to scrape up whatever they could get their hands on. Desperate for business, on January 7, 1933, the palace briefly returned to its vaudeville and movie schedule, only to cease it on February 11th, and again on April 29th, when vaudeville made a brief comeback, but it struggled to catch on and the palace could only book lesser acts who were willing to accept the torturous policies. The palace once again ceased vaudeville shows on September 30th, 1935. For 14 years, it was strictly a movie house. In 1936, it had a brief return to live performances, when Broadway producer Niles Grenland staged a series of variety shows beginning with Broadway Heatwave, featuring female orchestra leader Rita Rio. On May 19th, 1949, the RKO Palace reopened after a refurbishment and was now under the ownership of President and General Manager of the RKO Theater, Sol Schwartz, who attempted to revive vaudeville with a slate of eight acts before a feature film. For the first two years, these shows failed to catch on to the public. Meanwhile, Judy Garland was struggling in the film industry. After seeing the palace struggling in entertainment as well, she decided to head back home for a special appearance. She would help the palace, and the palace would help her in return. After another refurbishment, but this one more brief, the palace reopened with a show featuring Judy Garland on October 16, 1951. She did shows for 19 weeks, up until February 4, 1952. The shows were said to be phenomenal. After that, the palace would feature more stars such as Frank Sinatra, Jerry Lewis, Danny Kay, Harry Belafonte, and Liberace. The shows were successful, but the vaudeville revival never happened. In 1957, the popularity of television got the best of the palace, even with big-name stars like Liberace, who would be the last star to play at the palace during its final vaudeville era. 
the Palisades stage presentations on August 13, 1957, to become a full-time movie house, beginning with James Cagney's Man of a Thousand Faces. The building deteriorated during this time. You know what they say? When in doubt, Nederlanders to the rescue! Eight years later, in 1965, the palace was sold to James Nederlander and restored its original interior, crimson and gold with the original chandeliers on top for the auditorium, with a dash of portraits of past palace performers adorning the lobby, all of which were loaned by the Museum of the City of New York. The following year, on January 26, 1966, the palace reopened as a playhouse. The reopening was made into a big deal. News covered it everywhere. Television, print, radio, you name it. The palace's first show as a playhouse was the original production of Sweet Charity with Gwen Verdon. The show was a success. It had a book by Neil Simon, a score by Cy Coleman and Dorothy Fields, and choreography by Verdon's husband, the famous Bob Fosse. It was based on the film Knights of Cabiria and played the palace for 608 performances. Not bad for a first show. In the summer of 1967, after the show's closing, Judy Garland returned to the palace once more to perform. The performance was recorded for a live album. Judy Garland, At Home at the Palace, Opening Night. After the flop known as Henry Sweet Henry, the palace go on to host musicals such as Cyrano with Christopher Plummer, Richard Kiley in Man of La Mancha, a revival of Oklahoma, and a production of Frankenstein with John Carradine, which closed on opening night. Then, on August 21st, 1983, the palace struck gold with the premiere of La Caja Fall, a musical based on the French film of the same name. It went on to run for 1,761 performances, making it the palace's most successful show at the time, up until Belle and the Beast took over in 1994. Yes, this was where Disney on Broadway was born. Beauty and the Beast ran at the palace for five years up until it was relocated to the Lunt Fontaine in 1999 in order to make room for Disney's Aida, which ran from 2000 to 2004. Now let's get architectural. Um, is that even a word? We all know the great big billboard facade the palace is known for today, showing ads for not just its own shows, but other shows currently on Broadway. Behind those billboards is where its actual facade hides. It hasn't been uncovered for years, and only the original marquee is visible. Hey, did you know it's also got a hidden staircase? Dubbed the Judy Garland Staircase, it's located in the very back of the orchestra, and there's a secret door that leads there. Judy was known for using the staircase to make her big entrances when she performed and she was also known to have a cigarette or two beforehand. And now, we come to our last tidbit of architectural information, which unfortunately leads to kind of a sad ending. The theater has gone through a lot of renovations over the years, but nowhere near as big as this one. In 2015, the Nederlander Organization and Mayfield Development announced a $2 billion renovation plan for the palace. This renovation would have the lobby and dressing rooms replaced, as well as adding new patron amenities and a new entrance on 47th Street instead of the one facing Times Square that it was known for. The areas that once held the current lobby would be gutted in order to make room for retail space, including Judy Garland's iconic dressing room. In spite of the palace's status as an interior landmark since 1987, the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission approved the plan on November 24th of that year. Many conservationists, and myself, were against the idea. Unfortunately, the City Council approved the plan on June 28th, 2018. SpongeBob SquarePants was the last show to play the palace before the renovations. September 16th, 2018 was the day the palace held its last ever show in its original structure. The new palace is expected to open sometime in 2021. And with that, this episode has come to a close. It sure has had a long history. 
It's gone through successes, failures, vaudeville, movies, vaudeville again, movies again, and finally, Broadway shows. To think it was close to shutting down right after it opened. This theater will always be close to my heart, and I feel a sense of sadness when I think about how September 16th, 2018, was the last time I would ever set foot in the original structure. It was fortunate enough to end on a positive note. When I first set foot into this theater seven years ago, I had just entered college after suffering through four long years at a place that was very toxic for me. I had gone to see a show for my 19th birthday, and I only decided to see Priscilla because it was playing at the theater where one of my childhood favorites was filmed not knowing what I was getting myself into. I was greeted by a trio of drag queens that I swear, through song and dance, were trying to tell me, don't worry, everything's going to turn out just fine. The same exact thing happened at the last show I saw there. Only instead of drag queens, I was greeted by a happy-go-lucky undersea pineapple dweller from my childhood, who reminded that even when times are down, I should always try to make every day the best day ever. Palace Theater, all I can say is thank you. Thank you for the shows, whether they be good or bad. Thank you for the music. Thank you for the entertainment. Most of all, thank you for being a part of my childhood. And thank you for being there for me when I was starting to come out of a dark period in my life. I may never see you the same way again, but as everyone has told me, I will always have memories of you.